Welcome back to the Weekly Juice. As always, Ryan and Corey here with another episode for you. <laughs> Today we have on Dr. Joe Asamoa. He is a real estate investor from DC, actually originally from London, or sorry, Ghana, and then Ghana. moved to London, and now he's in DC. He originally worked in tech and transitioned over to full-time real estate investing, I believe it was in 87. So he's been through about 30 years in real estate, a bunch of different cycles, and he um, specializes in single family homes and rents them out to section eight tenants. But he has this way of fostering, managing, and just taking care of his relationships with these people that he essentially keeps tenants for 10 to 25 years in some cases. So a different episode today, very informative. Yep. And I think it'll take, you'll take a step back and you won't be afraid when you hear section eight or renting to section eight tenants moving forward. Yeah, these types of Section 8 tenants are renting properties that uh, cost $5,000 a month to rent. And those are most, that, that's more than up most mortgages, right? So these people are living in really high quality, as Joe says several times, HGTV type homes because he does the renovations himself. And he's just like a genius wealth of knowledge as it relates to real estate investing, the rehabs, and building and keeping relationships. And what he says is recession proof investing. You guys are going to love this episode. Let's do it. Let's dive in. If you like what you've been hearing, please subscribe, share with friends, rate, and leave a review on Apple Podcasts. That goes an extremely long way for us. As always, you can also find us on Instagram at Weekly Juice Pod for daily content to assist in your journey towards financial freedom. Let's get it. Dr. Joseph Asamoa, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to the Weekly Juice. It's an honor to have you here. Okay. Thank you very much, guys. I'm really looking forward to this. It's really an honor to be on your show. And I'm looking forward to sharing some, uh, hopefully, some good information to your audience. Thank you very much. So if you could just give a little background on yourself, where you're from, um, what you do for a living, and essentially how you got into real estate. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, I was born in Ghana. Uh, that's in West Africa. And then when we were five years old, my parents moved to England. So I lived in England most of my life until after I graduated. And um, then I was working, I was in sort of the telecoms uh, and, you know, business and uh, I was transferred by my job from London to Washington, D.C. Can you imagine that? And uh, so uh, I came here. I loved it. And um, kind of funny, after I came here, um, about six weeks when I was working my job, my boss got fired, and, um, which is unbelievable because this is a guy who's a classic corporate guy. He worked like 20 hours a day. Uh, traveling everywhere, you know, trying to go up that corporate ladder. And this guy was fired. Okay. And, uh, and so we hooked up about six weeks later uh, for, you know, for coffee. And uh, he says, Joe, this is America. This is, this is what happens. You know? <laughs> so, right after you came well, across the pond. Yeah, he made you, you move here. <laughs> exactly. Welcome to the real world, man. <laughs> and uh, so he says, well, it's no big deal. I've got these uh, rental properties. And, and this guy had like 10 houses uh, at the time. And I, I, at that time, I couldn't fathom how anybody could have more than one house. It's like, you know, how? How is that possible? You know? <laughs> this guy had 10. <laughs> so he says, I've got this rental income coming through. So I'm okay. Uh, and so he says to me, well, whatever you do, Joe, make sure you have a plan B. Because look what happened to me. Uh, and uh, this can happen just like that. And so he says, check out this real estate stuff. And if you, uh, if you get into real estate, which I recommend that you do, make sure that you keep your houses, don't sell them. And because over time, you'll be grateful for doing that. So that was that was that conversation is what sparked this whole, uh, you know, sort of intrigue into real estate. So, uh, you know, follow, you know, cut a long story short, you know, three o'clock one morning, I turned on the TV, there was this, you know, infomercial, you know, YouTube can do this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so uh, I bought this guy's you course. Yeah, you know the drill. Uh, Hawaii, you know, <laughs> boat to the background. <laughs> all you gotta do is give me a credit card. You know, <laughs> and you too can have all this. <laughs> and so uh, anyway, uh, I I I bought this guy's course and um, ended up going to a meeting in, up in DC. And I met some guy, 
and uh, who had a house which he wanted to sell me. Uh, no money down, you know, just like what you said in the infomercial. You know, so I ended up buying this house. Uh, it has some tenants in there. And so he said, uh, so, you know, I said, great, I bought the house and uh, I spoke to the, what's it called? Just before I bought the house, I told to the guy, you know, what are the tenants like? Oh man, they're great, they're fantastic, you know. So I bought the house and found out that they hadn't paid him for three months. Um, there was a water bill for $5,000 and oh. they're gonna sell the house at a tax sale. So that was my entree into real estate. And wow. it was a complete, complete utter disaster. <laughs> Everything that could have gone wrong went wrong. I mean, this, this is my first entree. I knew nothing, zero. <laughs> Okay, all I knew was what this infomercials guy said. And uh, so it was a disaster, but you know, I stuck through it and uh, I was able to turn that thing around. And I bought that house for $47,000. Uh, people telling me at that time I was paying too much. I was getting ripped off. And uh, so I bought it and uh, I learned from that experience. And I bought another one, I bought another one. I just kept on going until 2003 when uh, at that time I was worked at you know, one of the larger telecoms companies here in the US and uh, my income from my rental properties equaled my salary at my job. Uh, so that was the goal that, that guy told me about and I was always working towards that and I reached that milestone June the 3rd, 2003. Never forget and, it. Uh, so ever since then I've been kind of been, uh, you know, focused on real estate investing and uh, I'm a true believer in buy and hold uh, I'm a true believer in um, appreciate buying in areas where I appreciate in value. And um, that first house I bought for 47,000 is now worth 750,000. Uh, when I bought that first house, the cash flow was $50. <laughs> so I was going through all this hell for 50 bucks. <laughs> hey, I'll take the 750 though. <laughs> uh, the rent now of that same house is 4,700, you know, no mortgage. So I'm not saying that to brag. No, that's not the point. The point is that uh, it's, it's possible and it's not easy, but if you stick with it, you have a game plan and you stay focused, uh, real estate can really uh, be a vehicle towards building wealth and financial independence. Joe, I have a, a comment there to add in because I think what you're proving here is that if you have this sort of perseverance, and you can you can hold on through through the mud, so to speak, and go and go through the issues that you went through. Is that real estate's a forgiving? It can be a forgiving business, right? Because you That's held on. Uh, well, when did you buy this property? In in what? This year? is eighty seven, probably before you guys okay. were born. <laughs> eighty seven, <laughs> right? Eighty seven to twenty twenty. So yeah. we're talking about thirty three years. Which you held on to it, but you went way faster at the at the rate of inflation to get from forty seven thousand oh. to seven hundred and fifty thousand yeah. dollars. So it's it's That's incredible, no like that yeah. type of wealth to be built over even over a thirty year span. It can change people's lives. Well, the thing is, uh, knowing what I know now, because I've been through five. This is my fifth real estate cycle, so I've been through quite a few of them. I mean, I know how this stuff plays out. It's not pretty. <laughs> Uh, but I know how it works. And uh, it, as you said, uh, it's very forgiving over the long haul. And uh, especially if you buy in the right, either the right locations, uh, the right neighborhoods and so forth. Because one thing I've learned also is that, you know, it's forgiving, which is true. But I, I do believe that the real money, this is just my personal opinion. The real money in real estate is appreciation. Okay. Yes, it's good to get cash flow. <clears throat> yes, you can get some money in cash flow and so on. You know, but the real money, okay, is uh, appreciation. And one thing I've learned is that not all areas appreciate the same. <clears throat> they don't. And, and so if you're going to hold on to this thing for the long haul, you want to, again, this is my opinion, you want to have a, a nice payday after all of this. Okay. And, uh, and so looking back, uh, looking at my portfolio, and uh, I realized that, uh, you know, if I had to do it all over again, uh, I would definitely hold on to some stuff, but I'll be more strategic into, in terms of what I buy and where I buy. You know what I mean? Uh, because uh, if you're going to go through the trials and tribulations of tenants, if you're going to go through all the, uh, you know, the, the joys and pains of dealing with uh, being a landlord and so on, you want to have a payday at the end of all this, okay? And uh, the real payday, in my opinion, is, is buying stuff like this for 40, 50, 80, 100, 200, whatever it is, 
uh, and holding on to it and getting a nice payday at the end of the day. And so, uh, but not all, of, or not all areas, not all neighborhoods, not all markets appreciate the same. Okay. And so you kind of have to take it from that perspective. So when doing research and obviously you don't have the, the magic answer here, the magic eight ball, but people are going to be curious, like, okay, so how do you find those areas of appreciation? What do you specifically look for and where? Yeah. I mean, I mean, it, most areas have a historical path. Okay. So you can, whatever market you want to go in, uh, th there's some history behind that market. Okay. And it's not that difficult to find out. So if you're in Philly, there's a history of what's going on in Philly. If you're in DC, uh, you okay? Uh, yeah, if you're yeah. in DC, there's a history of, uh, of, of uh, what's it called? Uh, of how the DC market has played out. If you're in LA, it's the same thing. I mean, you can do the research to find historical uh, data on your market, okay? Now, within that market, there's a whole bunch of sub-markets, okay? So I'm in Washington, DC market, which is MSA. So it's a large, that spans Washington, D.C., it spans uh, Northern Virginia, it spans Maryland, and, uh, and so forth. So, so within that market, the, the MSA, you can drill down further, and you'll find out within certain locations, zip codes, neighborhoods, or whatever, the trends are different again, okay? And, and so it's that sort of granular knowledge of the market that you're entering. You can get the, uh, some historical perspective, and therefore that may guide you uh, of where to go within that market that you're focused on. That's great. The, I think a, a question that people are gonna be curious about, because it seems like you have a vast knowledge is what does your portfolio look like now? Since you know, you're talking about 87, sounds like that was the first time you, your first purchase. Yeah. Um, what does your portfolio look like now? And you have a, pri it sounds like you have a primary niche. Uh, I don't, that is, and I'll let you talk about it, but I know you invest a lot in Section 8. I think people will be curious because when people hear the word Section 8, sure. they're thinking one thing. They're thinking, well, sure. Joe may be investing in an area that doesn't appreciate a lot because sure. that's the kind of, the, sure. that's what people think of. But you're investing yeah. in Section 8 and it appreciates. So what does your portfolio look like? Sorry, long-winded. And can you talk a little bit about that strategy? Yeah, so I mean, I'm in the DC market, which is one probably one of the mo more expensive markets in the U.S. Um, you know, most I've got over 30 houses in the you know in the in, in this area. Uh, they're all single families, and I don't do apartment buildings. Uh, so these are all single family, not in the sense that single family is what I'm saying is one family. It could be row houses uh, as opposed right. to you know detached. And uh, majority are in Washington, D.C. proper. And, uh, and then you have some sprinkle around in Maryland as well. So that's my portfolio. Uh, they vary in price. Uh, right now, the portfolio comprises assets starting from around 300,000 all the way to 1.6 million. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and that again, uh, the average is for around six, seven hundred thousand, and um, but again, in this market, six hundred, seven hundred thousand is not a big deal. You know, it's right. not like other markets where you're kind of on top of the world. Over here, it's like, so what? You know, and <laughs> uh, and so on. So that's the that's the price point. Uh, I'm currently uh, I'm doing two projects right now, uh, which I just bought recently. So I'm mean, I, I'm still doing it. Uh, so let's just give you some numbers if, if that, if, if you want to know that Absolutely. one. So, um, the last one I bought, um, I bought two. Okay. So I think I've got it for four, let's say 450, 450,000. And, um, you know, we're spending around 200, 200,000 on the renovation. Okay. So these are major rehabs. These aren't just paint and coffee. These are major rehabs. Yep. And uh, it was a three bedroom, one bath when I bought the home. And we're turning it into a five bedroom, three and a half bath. So Joe, real quick, I wanna keep going with this. Is that $200,000 in a, a, a complete gut and knocking down walls and everything yeah. to, re to renovate the entire space? Is that what- Yes, that it's a HGTV grade rehab. And uh, you, know, you know, it's a three bedroom, one bath. So the question, the other house I'm doing, it was a three bedroom, one bath. We're turning that into a six bedroom, 
three and a half back. Okay. Now you're going to say, well, why are you doing, why are you, why are you adding all these bedrooms? Okay. And uh, the, the reason why is that uh, for the section eight model, the rents are based on two things. Okay. Two things alone. That's it. At the end of the day, it's based on the location, the neighborhood or the zip code where the property resides. Okay. And the second thing is the number of bedrooms. So the more bedrooms, the more rent. Hmm. Okay. So you and I, um, let's say uh, you, and buy, you and I buy a, a, th a three bedroom home. Okay. And uh, in this market, a three bedroom home, essentially the rent that you get will be negative cash flow. You're paying too much for the rent that comes in. Okay. So, okay then. So if you turn it into a four bedroom, what I found is that uh, you can probably break even in terms of the rents that you get. Follow me so far? Mm -hmm. If you turn it into a five bedroom, you can get cash flow now. Okay. So the three of us could have bought the same house. And based on our foresight and our understanding of the program, <clears throat> we can get three different rents. So you will be negative, you will be break even, and I'll be positive. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why I'm adding bedrooms. It's a very, it's a very strategic play uh, because the rent is based on the number of bedrooms plus the location. And again, not all areas pay the same rent. So once you understand it at that granular level, okay, you can sort of make it work for you. Okay, because you know how much you're gonna pay, you know what the rent's gonna be, and therefore you can decide, am I gonna break even, am I gonna lose money, or am I gonna make money? Okay, and that's essentially the model for a section. That's the reason why I went the section eight route. <clears throat> it's because if I rented to market in some markets, some, some areas, the rents that section eight pay is higher than market. Okay, so uh, especially when you increase the number of bedrooms. So, uh, and what I found is that in this area in Washington, most of the houses are typically three bedroom, one baths. I don't know what it's like in Philly where you are, but most of the houses, you know, naturally, they're kind of three bedrooms. You go in, living room, dining room, kitchen, upstairs, you've got three bedrooms, the bathroom maybe. Maybe the basement's got something down there, uh, maybe a bedroom, maybe not, I don't know. But typically in DC, it's three bedrooms upstairs. You've got a rec room down in the basement. Uh, it may or may not be high enough ceiling. And, uh, and so the question becomes, what do you do with that? Okay. And so what I found is that the, 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 if the basement is where you have the most latitude. Okay. That's where you can get the extra bedrooms. I'm not doing pop-ups. Okay. I'm not doing, ask you that. I'm, not do, I'm not doing any of that stuff. I'm using the same footprint. Okay. So I'm, taking, I'm, I'm taking the same house that you bought. Okay. And I'm saying, how do I get extra bedrooms? And most of those, uh, your options, in my, in my experience is that it's primarily in the basement. So when I go to a house, uh, I go straight to the basement. <laughs> I say, okay, what can I do down here? <laughs> uh, because that's where I have the most uh, ability to add value. Okay, that will give me a greater return on the rent. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Real quick, I just if you can give me a number, like just walk me through that. You buy it for four hundred fifty thousand dollars. It would rent for X okay. as it currently stands. After the renovations are done, it's worth X, and it would rent for whatever. Okay. I'm just curious what that. Sure. What that okay, would look so like. I'll talk to you about the one we just finished. Uh, uh, we did a burr on that one, and the tenant moved in. I completed the refinance. In fact, October the first. Okay, so okay. that's real hot. Okay. So that one, uh, it's on the same block as this one. I've got three houses on this particular block now. So, um, so that one we, I, I bought for, let's just say, I use the same numbers, 450, okay? Renovations, 200, that makes it uh, 650, okay, so far. And after the rehab, it was appraised at uh, 775. Got it. Okay. And uh, I refinanced out, I got a local, uh, there's a lender around here and uh, where I got a 675 loan. Okay, so all my money was paid out, got out. And uh, the rent is $5,462. Wow. The note is, I think it's, oh God. Uh, cause we just refinanced it. So, uh, I think it's 3000, uh, let's just say 
3,700. Okay, so 3,700 um, is PI. Uh, so you add another 500 bucks, uh, that's 42. Okay, and the rent is 54. Uh, 200K rehab, which means that your CapEx expenses, you know, your maintenance, repairs, because everything's new. Yeah. Uh, so you don't really have a whole lot of, uh, you know, the plumbing's bad, the AC's bad, because everything's new. Uh, so you don't have the same cost that you're having, a, because these houses are uh, 100 years old. Uh, so a typical 100-year-old house, you know, stuff is going to start breaking down. Uh, the systems. Uh, but we redo everything. So everything is new there. So we don't have the same expenses that you would have if I didn't do anything. And uh, these are HGTV quality homes. Uh, I would have no problem living there myself. And uh, these aren't crappy houses. These are nice houses in nice neighborhoods. And uh, these are B, B neighborhoods. Okay. So again, I'm debunking this whole Section 8 myth. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I, I, can, I can drill down further if you want. Absolutely. Just before you get into section eight, because that's, I definitely want to dive in there. Um, two questions for you. The first, talking about financing the deals that are um, finding funding. I think a lot, some people are still in the beginning phase of their sure. investing career and they're hearing 450K, 200K. These are pretty big numbers. Can sure. you walk us through maybe just how you accumulated the funds over time to be able to go do these deals? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I teach this stuff. So uh, I have students who are new as it's uh, just starting out. Okay. So uh, I know exactly the issues that and the concerns and the fears that a lot of uh, new investors will have. Whoa, 400, 200,000. What the hell is going on? You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I get it. <laughs> uh, so the question is, and this is it. This is, this is the, the, the fundamental question, okay? Having done this in this market here, it is always expensive. Whenever you're in appreciation, it's always, it's, it's always expensive. It, the first house I bought, believe it or not, people were telling me I was getting ripped off when I paid 47K. Okay? <laughs> it's always expensive. They're saying you're, you're being duped. <laughs> yep. okay? How the hell can you, how do you want to pay 47 for this thing? Yeah. <laughs> and so on. So, Fast forward 10 years from that, and it was worth 140, okay? And people are saying, you know, why the hell you want to buy that for 140? You're getting ripped off, okay? <laughs> You're getting duped. So, ten four, so fast forward another 10 years, it's now worth 340, okay? Uh, man, 340 for that thing? No way, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's, it's, you're getting ripped off. Okay, now it's 700, okay, 750, okay. Uh, well, no way they want to pay 750 for that thing. You get ripped off. It's, it's always expensive. Okay. The question is, it is what you got to accept that when you're these uh, 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 major markets like, uh, you know, like I'm in. Okay. And, and so the issue is, how do you get started at these crazy prices? Okay. That's the challenge. Okay. And uh, because it's probably not going to get any cheaper, you know. And, uh, and the thing is that uh, even though it's expensive 10 years ago, now people say I'm a genius. You know, well, you had a great foresight to buy it for 350. 10 years from now, they'll be saying, oh my God, Joe, you're a genius buying it for 750. I mean, how did you, how is that possible? You see what I'm saying? Because the prices would have gone even further and, uh, and so on. So, okay, how do you get started? And uh, at these crazy prices. And it boils down to a lot of the times into finance. Where's the money going to come from? Okay. And uh, you start where you are. If you have money, then you're good. If you don't have money, uh, then you have to have, there are people with money. Okay. Uh, a lot of the times those people with money may not know real estate. Okay. They, they, I mean, they, they're regular people working a uh, nine to five job. Uh, they've got some money saved up. Uh, it's, it's at the Bank of America earning 0.01%, uh, you know, and so on and so on. So, I mean, there's money out there, okay? Uh, if you don't have it, there are people out there who do have it. Now, the question is, why should they want to, what do you bring to the table that they'll want to do business with you, okay? And that's the challenge for uh, everybody on this call, is what do you bring to the table if you don't have the money, okay? You got to bring something and you got to bring expertise, 
okay? You gotta bring knowledge, you gotta know, you gotta bring know-how, you gotta be able to know how to pull all this stuff together, okay? Because that's your that's the talent that you bring to the table, which the guy with a girl with the money doesn't know how to do. Okay. So therefore that becomes the basis of some kind of uh, at least a discussion point. Okay. Is that uh, they can't do what you're doing and you can't do what you know, they've got strengths, you got strengths, you got weaknesses, they got weaknesses. How do you blend the two together to make it worthwhile? And, and, and so that's the challenge if you don't have the money. And uh, so there's people with money. Now, the other thing is that, uh, at least for me anyway, it's all about relationships, okay? Uh, I have a, you know, I mean, over time, I fund my projects three ways, okay? Uh, I have relationships with uh, commercial banks, okay? And, uh, you know, so they fund part of the transaction. The other parts, which, um, you know, the other component is private investors. You know, uh, there's people out there who know me or people who want to get into real estate. Uh, I show people how to do this. So in exchange for borrowing money, they get the opportunity to see how I execute the transaction. Uh, so it's not like they give me money and they cross their fingers and hopefully six months from now, the money will come back. Uh, no, I give them the chance to see where their money's going. Okay, they see the transaction and uh, because something good for them to know that, okay, I've invested one, two, three Main Street, and they can go to one, two, three Main Street and see stuff going on. Yep. Uh, there's a certain level of comfort. Uh, rather than Joe's bought a house in, or, or some gold mine in Nevada somewhere, and hopefully six months from now, they'll strike gold and I'll get my money back. Uh, you know, I haven't had too much luck on that part. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and the third part is whatever money is left over, I, I fund myself, okay? So it's a three-part funding strategy is relationships with banks or hard money lenders. They'll only borrow you 60, 75, 80%, okay? And then, okay, you have private investors who may top up more of that and whatever's left over, I do the delta. And then we do the transaction. Once it's complete uh, and the appraisers, uh, again, knowledge of the market, um, you know, you have a pretty good idea how much the ARV is gonna be. Hopefully it'll, uh, what's it called, get that value, you refinance it, pay off all the short-term um, you know, financial folks, and then replace that with permanent financing. Interesting. So <clears throat> you, you basically will cut the deal, and then as soon as it appraises, you, you pay everybody back, but then you keep the property long-term and you collect the cash flow monthly? Yes. Excellent. Yep. Excellent. Yes. So most of my money goes back. Uh, I, you know, with the refinance, uh, most of the money is paid off. Uh, most of the short-term money, I'm sorry. Uh, that's the private investor, the initial loan uh, is paid off. And then I replace that short-term money with permanent financing. Got it. Cool. So could you, now that we understand the functionality of how you, you structure these deals, I think that's really important. That's like the number one thing. Then I, I know that you talk about recession-proof investing and that's part of your strategy with Section 8. And you're, you've already debunked it for me. We have, Ryan and I have a Section 8 tenant. She's a wonderful woman. She's not paying $5,400 a month in rent, though. So I, I, I'm curious. 5,462. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I missed that. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm curious. How do you, like, just talk a little bit, uh, talk a little bit through, like, why people assume that when you're, if you're section eight, that your rent's going to be $500 a month and how you go in with the strategy of the section eight, that's 5,462. Right. That again, that's, it's, it's market specific. Yeah. So yeah. the rents in Philadelphia may be different than the rents here. The rents in uh, South Carolina may be different than here and so on. So it's, it's very neighborhood and or zip code dependent. Okay. So what I realized having gone through these cycles, um, it was kind of funny how I, uh, how I gravitated to Section 8, okay? I didn't start that way, okay? I was doing like everybody else, just renting it to whoever. Uh, I, I didn't know anything, you know? Um, I just bought this guy's course, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and so on. So it was in the mid-90s. We're going through a recession uh, here in D.C. And um, I used to live at this house in Washington, and uh, the... It was a, you know, at that time, D.C. was going downhill fast, okay? Mm. Uh, the neighborhood was real bad. And uh, so my wife said, we got to get the hell out of here. 
Uh, so we left and uh, fortunately I kept the house. And so I put it up for rent and this lady came over and said, it's a nice house, but I, I don't want to rent this house. And I said, you know, why? And she said, um, it doesn't have a jacuzzi. Uh, this is a section eight lady, okay. Uh, she, she, she said, it doesn't have a jacuzzi. I'm saying, pardon? <laughs> uh, you don't have hardwood floors uh, or stainless steel appliances. You know, you don't have any of that stuff. So, I, you know, I'm not going to rent your house. I, I'm saying, what? I mean, this is a lady with a net worth of zero. <laughs> she okay. wants what she wants. <laughs> Looking me straight in the face and saying, the house where I lived at, <laughs> you know, wasn't worthy of her. Uh, and I'm saying, what in the hell is going on? Uh, I mean, I understand it now. I didn't understand it then. Okay, what was going on is that we're going through a downturn, okay? And during the downturn, certain things happen, okay? Which if you haven't been through one, you don't know, okay? And people will be going through that very shortly, okay? What happens is that everybody wants the good tenant. You want them, I want them, everybody wants them. They're the one that pays the rent on time, they keep the house up, uh, they're pleasant to deal with. I mean, everybody wants that person, okay? You want them, I want them, okay? So there's a competition for that good person, okay? And she was one of those. She knew she was one of those. And uh, so I was competing with for her. The problem was that uh, there was a rehabber or rehabbers who rehabbed their homes with the intention of flipping it. But they couldn't flip it because the market crashed on them. Okay. So they had no other choice but to rent it. Okay. They paid too much. Okay. They didn't have any equity. The market was tanking, okay? And so they couldn't reduce their price. Uh, otherwise, they'll lose money. So the option was to rent. You follow me? And that rehab, a flipper, he had the stainless steel appliances. He had the jacuzzis uh, because he, he was intending to sell. But because he couldn't sell it, he now had to rent it. You follow me? Yeah, so now she's saying, hey, <laughs> there's this guy down the street. I mean, she didn't say this. There's this guy down the street who, who wanted to flip his house. Uh, he can't flip it. He's got a jacuzzi. He's got stainless steel appliances. He's got hardwood floors. And he wants me. Uh, and, hey, you know, why, why the hell do I want to go to your house when I can go to that one? I mean, in a roundabout way, that's what she's saying. Now, obviously, she didn't say that. Uh, but that's how markets play, okay? And, uh, and that's what's going to happen. If you got an apartment building, you are suddenly going to start competing with condos. You will. Uh, and the way the Section 8 program works is that the rent, the tenant's rent, is based on their income. Okay, so if their income's the same, it doesn't matter if they go to the house on top of the hill or the house on the bottom of the hill, their portion of the rent is still the same. So if their portion of the rent is still the same, they're going to gravitate to the better product. You follow me? So is it is it dependent upon the landlord just to whether or not they want to accept them into the section eight? Like, because can they take their voucher, the section eight voucher, anywhere they like? Yeah, they can go wherever they want. Okay, they can go to Philadelphia, they can go to LA, they can go whoever, wherever they want. Okay, and if they're in DC, they can go to anywhere in DC. Wow. Okay, so if I mean, let's role play here. If you if your rent was five hundred bucks, okay, and you had the choice to live in a a B neighborhood or a D neighborhood, and your rent's still the same, where would you live? It's a no brainer, right? Exactly. So that's the same thing. So they are saying, well, why would I want to live in a D neighborhood when I go to a B neighborhood? Okay. For the same rent. Why would I want to live in a house that doesn't have a jacuzzi and a stainless steel when I can get one for the same rent? You see what I'm saying? So that was the, that was the turning point. Okay. For me, it was that, that experience with that lady. She changed. There was a mind shift. I mean, I just could, I couldn't understand what the hell was going on. Um, but when I thought it through, I said, oh, okay. There's another group of voucher holders who are no different than you and I. They want to live in a nice house. They want to be in a nice neighborhood. They are very protective of their children. They want to be safe. They don't want to get shot at, okay? Because the stereotype is they live anywhere 
and they're going to trash your house anyway. And uh, they'll gravitate to the D neighborhoods because, you know, hey, that's all they got. Okay, that's the stereotype. And I realized that there's another group of people who are completely not like that. And, uh, and so I said, okay, then how do I compete in an environment like this, this down market? Okay. And the other way I can compete is to have a good product in a good area. Okay. Because if I got a good product in a good area, I can attract those people like her. Okay. And it's recession proof. Okay. Because it doesn't matter what market we're in. If you got a good house in a good area, you can attract that lady or that, that family. Okay. And, uh, and so on. So I, I changed my business model to start buying in, in, in better houses, uh, start buying regular houses, turn them into a better product, but focusing more on a better quality neighborhood because I can attract that better quality tenant. Okay, I call them the Nordstroms and uh, the Nordstrom voucher holders. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I call them. So how in the world can I attract these Nordstrom voucher holders, okay? And I realized those Nordstrom voucher holders are no different than you and I, absolutely no different. The only difference is they don't have any money, okay? And, but their aspirations, their, uh, their goals for their family and so on is no different than you and I, okay? So therefore I changed my business model to try to attract those people. And that was what was the major transformation because I realized that those people, the, the Nordstroms, if you can find them, and I mean, I know how to get them, um, you know, I mean, I know who they are. I know what they want. I know what they don't want. I know where they want to live. I know where they don't want to live. I know who they want to rent from. I know who they don't want to rent from. I mean, I know these folks. These are my customers. I know them. <laughs> I mean, I have a business background, so I, I get business. And uh, so any business, you got to understand who your market, who your tenant or your customer is. Okay. And you drive it in such a way that you meet the needs of that customer. Because if you can understand who your customer is, you know what their needs are you can have a product that nails it. And, uh, and therefore you can attract that customer that you want. And that's essentially uh, what I do. And with the model that I have, you know, um, four things happen, okay? One, these families, when they come to your homes, I mean, these are nice houses, okay? These are, I mean, these are HGT quality homes, okay? Four things are going to happen. One, they're going to pay the rent <laughs> because if they don't get, if, if, if the alternative is to go back to that crappy house, that crappy neighborhood, that crappy landlord, and they've been there, they're not going back. Okay. So, uh, so if they don't pay the rent, they're going back over there. Okay. So then that's not going to happen. One, so they, they, they pay their rent. Two, they take care of your home. They don't trash it, all the stereotypical stuff that you hear about. They don't do that. Okay, because again, the alternative is to go back and they're not going back, okay? Three, they're pleasant to deal with, okay? And you're gonna have to believe me on this one. Uh, what we're doing uh, is providing life-changing opportunities to these families, life-changing, okay? Uh, never in, the, in their wildest dreams did they think that they'll get a chance to live in a HGTV quality home in the B neighborhood. They never thought that would ever happen, okay? And so they are now given that chance. Their kids are in better schools, they're in a better neighborhood, better amenities, and close to transportation, shopping, school. They're, they've got access to all that stuff, okay? Which they never in their wildest dreams did they think that was possible, okay? And so because of that, it goes to number four, which is the key. They stay a long time. They yeah. never leave, <laughs> okay? You're talking, my longest tenant is 23 years, okay? And I have... 15-year tenants, 12-year tenants, they don't leave, okay? And that is the formula, okay? Every landlord, including yourself, are looking for one, four things from your tenants, okay? I mean, I don't know. I'm going I'm to put my, I'm going to put words in your mouth. Your ideal tenant, okay, is somebody who pays the rent on time, correct? <laughs> That's it. Your ideal tenant is someone who takes care of your house. Two. Your ideal tenant is pleasant to deal with. Three. <laughs> Your ideal tenant stays a long time. Four. That's it. You got it. And it's funny that you say that because we inherited a Section 8 tenant, and Ryan and I had a preconceived notion. And it was, it was debunked. Yeah, I don't, know, yeah, I don't know if she's the Nordstrom that you're talking about because right. the previous landlord didn't raise the rent like he should have and we're going to, but um, she 
So far, pays her rent on time, keeps the place immaculate, is a pleasure to deal with, and she's been there for 10 years. So the things that you're talking about, are we're actually realizing that maybe we will be accepting vouchers, assuming that the people that we get are the people that you get, right? And, and I think there's a, a point that you've brought up in, in some of the articles I've read and things that you've talked about is you have... I think people want to know, they're like, all right, this all sounds amazing, but how do I specifically attract and find these type of people? And I believe your screening process, you have an eight page uh, application, something crazy, not crazy, but obviously ideal, it's work. Can you dive into that and just kind of how that all Yeah, unfolds? how you get, how you talked about, you said, you know, your customer, how do you, yeah, how do you right. find these people? Okay. So step one is starts off with a nice house. Okay. Right. For the, for, for the section eight, um, it all starts off with the neighborhood, okay? Uh, that's the driver for a lot of these Nordstrom families, okay? It's the neighborhood. If you got an a, a okay house in a good area, you're more likely to attract them than if you have an a okay house in a good area versus a good house in a bad area. Right. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yep. Uh, you don't want the best, the best house on the block is what you're saying. If it's Well, it's a neighborhood first. If it means around that area, okay. That, right. I mean, again, I, I'm talking abstract, okay. Um, based on my understanding, okay. They're used to living in bad areas, and especially areas that aren't safe, okay. So they're trying to get out of that, uh, uh, you know, for the most part. Now, obviously, you know, people will live everywhere. So it's not a problem there. So the first thing is the product that you have and the area where the product is, okay? So now, okay, so step one is obviously I advertise like everybody else and in you know, regular channels. And uh, there are certain, if you go to your local housing authority, they will tell you where they uh, tell their voucher holders to go look for, for, for properties, okay? So they either may have a list or they may say, okay, we, t we, you know, we tell our, voucher holders to go to Zillow or Go Section 8 or whatever it is. There's, there's some online platform where, um, you know, voucher holders go to see what's available in the marketplace. Okay. So you need to know what that is uh, in your area. And then you advertise there. Okay. And so you then, on your advertising, you have some great photographs and all the descriptions and so on. And you say Section 8 welcome. That's what I do anyway. So they know straight up front that I'm open to voucher holders. So people come to the house, they look around, it's a nice house. I stage my homes. Oh. Furniture is on there, it's yep. beautiful, okay? And uh, so they come in, you know, they like the homes. I give them the uh, spiel, they look around, and then they have, uh, I have, I ask them to complete an application. And on the first page of the application, it says we're going to do these four things. We're going to contact your current landlord, previous landlord. Uh, we're going to check your income, check your credit. And on top of that, we're going to go to your home to see how oh. you keep your home. Okay. Uh, that's on the application. And every time we speak to them, they say, we're going to, this is what we're going to do. And okay. you do so there's it, no, right, what? And you always do that, right? Oh yeah. yeah. So there's no confusion uh, about the process. So what happens is that um, they self screen themselves. Okay. If you don't want me to go to your house because your house is trashed. Okay. You're not going to waste your time filling an application. And paying an application fee, you're not because uh, they know straight up front this is what's going to happen. So you know, all you and uh, uh, my my application is eight pages. It's very in, intrusive. <laughs> uh, it's, it's pretty detailed. Okay, <laughs> so you're not you know. So a lot of people are going to be intimidated by that. A lot of people are going to say, why? why do you want to come to my house? Why is this application eight pages? What's all this? What the hell are you doing all this for? Okay. Uh, now, the reason why I don't get that pushback is because I got a product that they want. Okay. And I have a product that they, they know and I know that if they don't get my house, they're not going to find anything like this again, period. Okay. Because most of the landlords that rent to Section 8 uh, are your stereotypical. Crappy house, crappy neighborhood. And, uh, you know, and so on. And so everyone's over here, I'm over here. And they know that. Um, and, and so they know that if they don't get my house, it's gonna be very, very, it's gonna be a long time before they see something of that caliber, okay? So what happens is that you now attract the creme de la creme. 
those people say, okay, no problem. You, you want to come to my house? Let's go. Uh, uh, you want to call my landlord? Good. Okay, he's a 301. Thing. Call him right now. He'll tell you what kind of person I am. Uh, you know, uh, you got an application? Okay, fine. Let's fill it out. I mean, you, you, you attract that caliber of people, okay, who are intimidated by that because I have a product that they want and they know that this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. And on top of that, I tell them, you know, I'm the world's greatest landlord. <laughs> uh, I'm looking for the world's greatest tenant. Is that you? Uh, and they say, yes, because this, the following, blah, blah, blah. I mean, this is what, you're going to have to believe me on this one. Uh, there are, they are out there. Okay. And, uh, you know, they debunk the stereotype. Okay. And uh, they're just looking for somebody, you, me, us, to give them a chance. Because for the most part, society's written them off. Uh, for the most part, uh, you know, they're sort of destined for crappy housing, crappy neighborhoods, but that's not really what, who they are, and that's not really what they want, okay? But they don't have a whole lot of other choices, okay? And so here comes you guys uh, with a better product and so forth. And as long as you can screen right, and that's the key, as long as you can screen right and attract that Nordstrom's, um, it's it's really it's truly a joy. I mean, I, I mean, I'm in Washington D.C. Okay, which is probably one of the most tenant-friendly jurisdictions in the United States. Okay, and I love being a landlord for Section Eight tenants in Washington D.C. <laughs> <laughs> so I, that's phenomenal. I think I love uh, you talk. Real estate is a, and we talk it too. Real estate's a relationship business, and you claim you're the world's best landlord on this application. I actually don't doubt that. On a few things I know. Can you please walk through for the listeners on how you roll out the red carpet for these tenants, aside from specifically just dolling up the house and making it a pleasure to live in? Um, specifically, I'm looking for the story about um, the timeshare and then also little touch points along the way that set you apart differently, um, what you do throughout the year for your tenants. Sure. Okay, one thing I realize is that uh, this is a business philosophy, okay? I mean, you, 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 I, you, I'm coming in from a business standpoint, okay? Which is, it's cheaper to have an existing customer happy and, 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 and continue doing business with you than it is to go and find another customer, okay? That's business 101 any business, okay? It's cheaper to keep an existing customer happy than it is to go find another one, okay? So if you believe that, okay, you can apply that to real estate. It's cheaper to keep an existing tenant happy so they stay than it is to go find another one, okay? Because as you know, you guys know, the biggest expense in, uh, as a buy and hold investor is turnover and yep. vacancy. That will wipe out all your profits. No questions about it and so on. So therefore, if you can't manage that turnover of vacancy, I don't care what anybody says, you will make no money. Okay. And, uh, and so on. So once I realized that, and again, it's a very simple concept, but most landlords don't get it. Okay. Uh, once I realized that I said, okay, then how do I make sure that my tenants stay a long time? Okay. Uh, once they're in the house. Okay. And, and then it becomes, I want to make sure that they're happy. Okay, so the question is, okay, how do you make them happy? Uh, and I realized that um, apart from the asset, which is the real estate, your biggest, you know, I mean, the, the biggest, the other biggest asset is your tenant. <laughs> okay, uh, and so every Mother's Day, bouquets of flowers. Every one of them gets bouquets of flowers. Okay, two, um, every Christmas, all our tenants get Christmas presents. Three, if the kids get uh, all A's on their report cards and, <laughs> and they show it to me, uh, I give them fifty dollars as a thank you, congratulations, and keep up the good work. Okay, all That's of them. Awesome. Okay, four. This is the crazy one. <laughs> we have a timeshare up in the Virginia the mountains, about two and a half hours from here, uh, where we can invite guests to come. Uh, for three days, two nights, all our tenants get free vacations. <laughs> why, 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 would, why would they ever? 
the best <laughs> landlord in the world. <laughs> Get it. Get it. It's amazing. Yeah. That's so how many how many how many landlords do you know? <laughs> Mother's Day bouquets, Christmas presents, free vacations. Okay. It's zero. It's, it's incredible. And Ryan and I were talking about this last week. And we're talking about how, what things we can do to make sure our, our tenants are happy. And we talked about the gifts. But if we have to compete with <laughs> a timeshare, I don't know what we're going to do, because you're going to take our tenants. <laughs> <laughs> well, here, here's a crazy thing it says is that the bouquet of flowers, what, 25, 30 bucks? Yep. Christmas present, 30 bucks. $50 gifts. Okay, so we're at 110 bucks, right? Uh, and uh, the, the, the time share is free. Okay, it doesn't cost me anything. Okay, so we're talking 150 bucks max right. for those three things, for those four things, okay? Which is nothing, okay? But the goodwill it engenders, the loyalty it engenders, uh, the, you know, the just... I mean, just the fact that you are treating them as human beings, you know, and uh, there's a certain level of loyalty that that generates. And on, on top of that, you're in a nice house, in a nice neighborhood, and a good quality landlord who's taking care of the house. If something goes wrong, you fix it, okay? And all those things, which is your responsibility as a landlord. We add all that stuff together, okay? Uh, you get, uh, you, you, you get a situation whereby they, they're not even thinking of leaving. They're not, okay? And that's how you get your five, 10, 15, 20 year tenants, okay? So- You just, you just gave us the key here, you really did. It's, made, yeah. it's great information because um, we have a tenant who's been there for 10 years and one who was talking to us and they were like, we're looking to buy a, a, buy a home in, in a year. Maybe we can, be such good landlords that they won't do that. Although I want them to prosper. I want them to buy a home if that's what they want to do. But I'm saying maybe we can do the things that you're talking about to keep them around. Well, you can buy a house and do a rent back to them. Or, something, you know. <laughs> <laughs> or rent to own or something. You know. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, there's, um, you know, and that's on the premise. See, this is, this is, this is, all this is based on the fundamental hypothesis. And that is turnover and vacancy is by far the most expensive element of being a landlord. So how do I drive that cost to zero? By and you, can drive, you can drive it to zero for 150 bucks. That's amazing. So I have a, this might be a hot take on your, on your side here, but we've been told multiple times that it's a better idea to act as if you were the property managers and not let tenants know that you own the property. And I'd like your take on this because it seems as if you're front facing and you do multiple touch points a year that you'd, you know, you'd want them to know that you're the landlord and you own the property. What's your take? Yeah, I mean, they know I own my house. They know I own the houses. I mean, uh, it, you know, I mean, yeah, they, they know I own the homes. Uh, they know that I'm the decision. I mean, I don't interact with them on the day. I have an assistant. Cause I have so many houses now. I don't, you know, so I couldn't find a management company that did it my way because no management company buys bouquets of flowers and Christmas. No one, no free vacation. No, no one does that. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be tough to find. Okay. So I couldn't give it. I, if I gave it to a management company to screen tenants, they're not going to go to their homes. They're not going to do any, they don't have any, you know, they're not going to do any of that stuff. Okay. So I had to uh, train my assistant to do it my way, okay? So uh, although, although I own all these houses, I don't, you know, something goes wrong, they don't call me for the most part, they call my assistant. But if we don't hear, if I don't hear, I mean, every so often we check in. Uh, hey, you know, uh, Miss Jones, uh, is everything okay? I haven't heard from you for a few months, just check, make sure everything's okay, make sure the kids are okay, you know, and so on. Um, so there's that, per because at the end of the day, after all is said and done, you're rented to human beings. Yep. Okay, that's it. Okay, that's the bottom line. Okay, and your success is is so entrenched. Okay, with that relationship with your tenant, 
that's the key to your success in this thing, okay, as a buy and hold investor. And so I want to make that relationship so strong that it's a pure win, for, it's a win-win, okay? They are happy uh, because you need, when, uh, I mean, I videotape when I, when I, when I give them the news that they've got the house, uh, I videotape it, okay? You know, <laughs> you got to be there when that happens. I mean, I'll, I'll show you some videos. I mean, yeah, you oh send us one. That's actually really cool. I would love to see it. These are, I mean, these are life changing events, okay? Where they are eternally grateful, eternally grateful, okay? That you giving them a chance. I mean, I was speaking to one of my tenants a couple of weeks ago. Her kids, she's got two kids. Uh, one's going to college. He's got a 4.0 average, okay? And another one's going to another uh, college, okay? She said there's no way that they would be being a college bound if they lived in their previous neighborhood. Hmm. No way, okay? Wow. They're in a different school, a better school, they're a, a better environment. And these are life-changing, ex- you know, things that we're talking about here. And uh, so, yes, you can make money, but also you're doing real good. I was going to say, you, 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 can, you can rest your head at night knowing that you're not only making money for you and your family, but for the 30 properties that you own, you're helping, you're helping people out along the way. And isn't that really like it's the, about. what it's all about? Yeah, it's, exactly. it's, it's, it's awesome. It That's really it. is awesome. At the end of the day, you want to leave a legacy. Okay. You know, what at the end of the day does... Do what do, you know what what do you what does Ryan want to leave as a legacy? Okay, you know, what do you want to be remembered for? Okay, if what? <laughs> why are you doing all this stuff? <laughs> you know, why not? Why five houses? Why ten? Why fifteen? Why, why are you doing all this? Okay, is it just for you? Okay, uh, if so, then that's okay. But I, I realize this uh, because my, in fact, I had a conversation with my mom. <laughs> You know, she's in England. So uh, what's it called? So we had a conversation about five years ago. She said, look, Joe, you know, why are you doing this? When is enough enough? I mean, she's not an investor, okay? She's just a regular mom, okay? <laughs> <laughs> she said, yo, why are you doing this? Isn't it enough enough? Uh, you know, um, and, and I thought about that. And I, I, I really was saying, maybe I've got enough houses. Maybe I, I have enough, okay? I mean, I'm okay. We're doing okay. But then I thought about it further. And I said, if I don't do this, if I don't buy more houses, these families aren't going to be given the chance, these opportunities to live in these nice homes. Because no one's doing what I'm doing, for the most part. So I have the opportunity to do good. So why would I want to stop? You you know what I mean? Uh, I want to make an impact on other people. I want to live a legacy you know what i mean and uh and so on so it's almost selfish of me to stop <laughs> <laughs> in a way <laughs> in a way you're right but so don't stop because you're doing great <laughs> i think it's powerful i think i think it's incredible and you just it just goes to show that it's not a a money driven business all the time and no and you you prove something to me joe and i know you do this for a living in terms of teaching but i can tell just the way you speak you've changed in my mind I know now that I'm going to try to create a better product for my tenants. Like whether that's simply right now, we're just getting started, we're bootstrapped and we don't have all the funds that you do. Sure. We're going to do the gifts for sure. No question. But the next step would be to do more of a renovation to make sure things are, are uh, the turnovers are uh, spotless and, and everything is fixed. And th- those are the things that I think that will lead to a turnover in, in nine years versus two. Hundred percent. I we talked about briefly just, and I forget where I read this. It could like it honestly could have been from you, Joe. But potentially at the end of a, a turnover, you know, asking what's one project that you wish would be done in your house, or what's one thing you'd like to be changed that we can get essentially give to the tenant. I, I'm thinking of our ten our tenant that's been there for ten years. Like, hey, listen, like if you could change one thing or make one thing better, what would it be? And then she might come back with three things that she wants. And if we take care of one of them, I just think it's a nice move. And it's another touch point on top of the cards, the gifts and, and things like that. Just. Yeah. I mean, as I said, uh, it, it's um, every business has customers and you die by your customers and live by your customers. If they don't, if they don't do business with you, you have no income. 
which means that you're going to go broke. Okay. Now, so therefore, it's again, it's all back to I realize that these folks are my lifeblood for my, you know, I can get financially, I've attained, attained financial independence because of these families. Okay. Um, without them, I wouldn't be, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Okay. And, and I get that. Uh, and so I want to make sure that I treat them well. It's almost like a self-interest. Uh, I treat them well because I can do better myself. Okay, so it's it's one of those uh, you know it's symbiotic relationship, and it's not that expensive, you know. We, I said we're talking 150 but 200 bucks. Yeah. But if you if you think about a, if if the rent is 5,000 bucks, let's just say let's just say a regular 3,000 dollar rent, okay. A turnover is going to run you at least one month. You know, when a tenant leaves, you got to paint it, you got to clean it, you got to advertise. Uh, 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 the best case scenario, you're not going to you're not going to get somebody moved in until the following month, okay? So if your rent is three thousand, there's three thousand dollars gone through that turnover, okay? If that turnover takes you two months because they have to give a thirty day notice, okay? That turnover is now cost you six thousand bucks, okay? And uh, and so on. So every turnover is going to uh, then you got your time, uh, your aggravation. You know, uh, da da. You got all that stuff to deal with. Okay, so it's going to run you about six thousand bucks. Let's just say. Okay, so will I trade two hundred bucks to save six thousand? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no brainer. No brainer. Yeah, yeah. But, but 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 the thing is that most landlords don't see it that way. Short sighted is what you're saying. They don't see it. They just see these are the tenants. I don't want to see them. I don't want to hear from them. I don't, I don't want to know that they're around. All I want is my rent. Okay. As long as they pay my rent, I'm, I'm fine. And I don't want to see them. I don't want to know them. I don't, I don't, I don't care about them. Okay. And, uh, and so on. So that's what the typical mindset of a lot of landlords. And, uh, and that's why I'm saying that model, it may work, but I think the one that I'm just describing to you is a lot more sustainable. Yours 100% works. Actually, in my nine to five, I work in service and retention. And that's the whole game, right? It's retaining customers and doing touch points along the way. So you're, and it's funny. That's partly why I got into real estate. And I saw, I'm like, I'm doing the same thing every single day, just in a different business. So if I can get the real estate, I know how to keep them. I totally do. I can learn what they like and what they dislike and make a, a beautiful product. Product. So I think it's it's amazing that you dove into that and you're well, well, here, 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 here's the other interesting thing is that if you have that good relationship with a tenant let's say we're in the dead of, dead of winter okay and the, the heating system goes out okay now a couple of things is going to happen uh, the tenant's going to call you and hey guys uh, my heating system's gone okay and, and you say oh, okay well, i'll get to it uh, a day goes by, two days go by, three days go by, and nothing happens. Okay. A couple of things is going to happen. Uh, you know, one is they're going to get ticked off. <laughs> yep. Okay. And if you don't resolve it pretty quickly, they're either going to call the city on you. <laughs> okay. Or they're going to stop paying their rent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Both are bad. <laughs> What, whatever it is, it's not going to be good. Okay. Their only recourse is to a higher authority, whether it be the court, the city, to resolve this issue that you're not, you're not taking care of. Okay. If you have a good working relationship with your tenant, and as long as, you know, that communication is there, they know that you're, you know, okay, the seating system's gone. Okay. But you're attending to it, or you say, you know, I'm, uh, I've called so and so, I'm, I'm, you know, and so forth. It's going to be, we're going to uh, get around to it soon. Uh, I may give them some portable heating units in the meantime, um, you know, and so forth. So at least they see I'm doing something. Yep. They are probably not, the first thing they're going to do is probably not call the city. Okay. They're not probably not going to call the housing authority, and they're probably not going to do all those sort of, uh, take all those actions which they could okay so again the point is that the relationship is so important to them and I've nurtured that relationship that you can usually work out your differences okay because it's not in their interest to go 
if they leave, they know that their alternative is to go back. And they don't want to go back. So they'll do what they're going to do to make sure that we, they stay. It's in their interest as well. So it's that understanding of the relationship, the, the customer service, the, the tenant, the, the, the retention. How do you run a business whereby it's, it's, it's in their interest to continue doing business with you? It's in their interest. <laughs> Yeah, right. which is back almost like reverse of what you would think. Right. But Rai has a question. So I have one last one for you before we get into the last segment of the show, just to tie, tie everything together here. So you seem like you, obviously you have a lot going on with multiple tenants, multiple properties. And you mentioned you had a, an assistant that kind of helps manage the properties for you. You trained it, he or she to do the things the way that you like to do. Can you tie a bow and everything and put it together and just explain the systems that you use on a daily basis to help run your business. You just get very granular if you could like maybe programs, apps, like how you okay. keep this thing running efficiently. Okay. Okay. So let's say, um, uh, it, I mean, I used to be an, I used to be an engineer. So people, people, processes, technology, <laughs> organization at a high level okay mm -hmm. uh, right. people um you know i realized that um you know the key to my success are relationships okay so uh, so i surround myself with what i call the a team i got great contractors if you're doing two hundred thousand dollar rehab you can't do that without good contractors it's just yeah. not possible okay and i'm sure most of your audience have had have got contractor stories okay so uh, what's it called? I don't have those issues for the most part because I've got great contractors and I take care of them. Okay, these guys who, you know, uh, I know you wouldn't believe this, but I mean, uh, my contractors, there's two key guys. Uh, when I met them, one guy was living like in an apartment somewhere, him and his wife and three kids in a two bedroom apartment. I mean, this guy's a genius. Uh, and, uh, and this other guy, he was living in the rooming house. Okay. These are contractors. These are guys that are sharp. Okay. I bought some houses and uh, pretty decent neighborhood. So I, I said, you know, you can rent my house. Okay. And all I care about is that you pay whatever the mortgage is. Okay. So they live, they live in one of my five bedroom homes and the other ones live in another one of my five bedroom homes um, because I'm taking care of, because not because I'm taking care of them. It's because they're just good people. And uh, I value what they do. Without them, this is not possible. It is not possible to do what we're doing without good contractors. And if you find good contractors, you better take care of them. Because if you don't, the alternative is just a headache after headache after headache. Okay? So it's, it's, it's the team. Uh, that's the contractor, the financial folks, the attorneys, uh, the real estate agents. It's what, the way I do things is how do I create win-win scenarios? with everybody who I do business with. How do I create a win-win where they, they want to do business with me and how can I make sure that I sort of nurture that relationship? I'm coming from that perspective, okay? So it's the, the people, the team uh, is, 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 is number one, okay? Uh, the processes, you know, I mean, uh, it's, real estate is a life cycle. I mean, it has a beginning, middle and end. Uh, you start off with, you know, finding the house, you got to rehab the house, you got to you know, go through that whole permitting process. Ultimately, you know, the house is ready. You got to find the tenant, you got to screen the tenants, you got to move the tenant, you got to deal with the housing authority. You know, after that, you got to, I mean, there's a whole bunch of different, it's a process, okay? <laughs> Sounds like our last couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's a process. And uh, so it's, it's a matter of, what's it called? Uh, understanding that process. Uh, and, uh, and then imp continuous improvement, you know, how do you make it better? Um, you know, and things like that, uh, technology, um, you know, we got tools that we use. I mean, we use, uh, what's it called? Buildium for managing the soft, uh, managing the, uh, what's it called? Uh, the, the tenant relationships, uh, have a CPA. She does uh, not one, let's see, uh, the bookkeeper, I suppose. Uh, she's a virtual bookkeeper is QuickBooks. Um, you know, we, I, I track everything, all the transactions, any project, I know exactly how much, uh, we're spending and what we're doing. Um, and, uh, so that's another aspect is the, the, the technology, the tools. Um, what else? And the organization is just really, it's a very lean, it's just myself and my assistant. That's it. <laughs> well, that's great. No, that's, that's, that's exactly the information that we wanted. I have uh, one more pop in my head. Last one, and then yep. we'll get to the end of the show. 
So you mentioned life cycles and our real estate market cycles, and we, you've been to through four or five, and you mentioned very soon that we are going to be in a crash again. So you think, what's your take on the market right now? And, and like, where do you, where do you see it going in the next X amount of time? Like what's the downfall look like to you? I know right now people in our market are spending 20% over asking for some, some properties. And, and I just want to, kind of get a gauge on what other investors see the downfall or the, 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 the cycle flattening out. Sure. I mean, it, we go through cycles. That's just the way, that's the way it is. I mean, uh, a downturn will come. I mean, no one just, we just don't know when. Okay. And so, as I said, I've been through a lot of these things and that's the reason why I went to section eight. Okay. It's because it doesn't matter. You know, the, the rent is 5,400, the tenant's portion is 500 bucks. Okay. So every month, let's just say, let's say that the rent is 5,500 and the tenant's portion is 500. So every month, $5,000 is coming from the housing authority. Okay, regardless, as long as that tenant's in there, 5,000 is hitting my account on the first, every month, come what may. Cycle, no cycle, it doesn't matter, it's coming, okay? And uh, so, and then, you know, the tenant is responsible for the 500 and they're not gonna, they're gonna pay it. If they lose their job, uh, two scenarios. Scenario number one, I have market renters like you guys, like most of the people here who don't want to rent Section 8, okay? So um, a, a downturn occurs, your market renter loses their job, let's say, okay? There is nothing worse than you got a great tenant who's lost their job, okay? Because they, they can't pay you. And especially when you're in a moratorium, there's not a whole lot you can do about it, <laughs> okay? So, so that relationship is going to go south, not because they're bad people. You said like they can't pay the rent, you know, and, uh, and so on. So that's what happens in a downturn. People lose their jobs. People lose their hours. Okay. People, money's tight. I mean, the moratorium is going to end at some point. Okay. There's going to be a, whole lot, a lot of people out there who, who are going to have the evictions, who are going to have vacancies. And there's a lot of people there who don't have work or got cut hours. Okay, there's, it's, it's, it's inevitable. I mean, it, it's just a matter of time. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't have those issues with Section Eight. Okay, because if the tenant loses their job, their rent is based on their income. So they just go off to the housing authority and say, "Okay, my rent was five hundred dollars. I lost my job, so their rent goes from five hundred maybe to two hundred and the housing authority picks up the slack from 5,000 to 5,300. You see what I'm saying? So yeah. that's how it works. So it's, it's, it's almost recession proof. Yeah, and yeah. that's it, okay? That's how I've been able to go through these cycles because it doesn't matter. You know, you got a good product. There's a lot of people who got vouchers who are yearning for these quality homes. They don't have it, you know, especially the four, five, six bedrooms, okay? Because they don't exist for the most part, high demand, low supply, okay? Uh, so I've got a product that's in high demand, low supply, okay? In a quality house, a quality neighborhood. Uh, I've got a tenant who the, the income stream for the most part is guaranteed by the most stable um, source in the world, okay? The US government, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that, state, that, that income stream is guaranteed. I've been doing this for uh, almost 30, over 30 years. There has never, you're going to have to believe me, there has never been a month where they didn't pay their rent, the housing authority, never, in 30 years. If that tenant's in that house, your rent is coming. Okay? So, and that's what I'm saying. Once you break it down, it's like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> it, it, makes a lot, it makes a lot more sense since we've had this conversation than it did before. So, I mean, I appreciate you breaking it down like that. Um, we respect your time and I, we want to go with to the last segment of the show called the last drop. So you're getting your last um, drop of information. And okay. we, um, we typically do with that is ask you for a, a resource, a recommendation, a, a podcast, an app, a book, a, a tool that you use, whether that's on a daily basis or you've ha that, have, that you have used that have helped or could help new investors that want to get started or whether that's in Section 8 or just um, in real estate investing in general? And I'm just curious if you... Sure. Uh, that's a good question. I didn't, I didn't expect that question. That's okay. <laughs> um, where's the wisdom? Um, Great. 
I think words of wisdom, if I had to do it all over again, what would I do? That's probably a good one. Well um, you know, uh, I, I think I would, I would, I would say probably, first of all, I would work on yourself. Because so, I think you have to work on yourself, you know, to kind of understand what your strengths are. Because we're all different. You have strengths. I have strengths. You got areas of weaknesses. You got, you know, and so forth. So we need to understand that, and we need to take the time to, you know, to 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 sort of uh, understand our goals. What why why are we where are we going? Why are we doing this? Okay, is it to uh, to to quit the job? Is it to get income stream? Is it to get uh, cash flow? Is it to get chunks of? I mean, why are you doing all this? Okay, and. Uh, and make sure you get the buy-in from friends, family, spouse, you know, because if they're not on board, uh, it's not easy. Okay. Why are you doing this real estate stuff? It's a scam. You know? <laughs> go to the, let's go to the bar instead. You know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you got to, yeah, otherwise they'll be pulling you away. You know what I mean? <laughs> so they got to buy into this stuff, but that's not always easy. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's number one. So the, uh, and then you kind of have to say, okay, what's my area of focus? Because there's so many different niches, you know, in real estate investing, you know, if you're not anchored properly, you're going to, you know, you're going to listen to your podcast. Oh, you get some guy who's, who's doing self storage one week. Another guy comes in, I'm doing commercial. Next guy comes in the following week. I'm going to be doing, you know, whatever. Okay. You know, you'll be all over the place. And uh, you know, because there's always something sexy. Uh, sexier uh, uh, than whatever it is that you're doing. And if you're not careful, you'll be running all over the place and really get nothing accomplished, okay? So kind of identify what's your area of focus. I am very focused on single family homes. Uh, I'm, I'm very focused on certain neighborhoods uh, where I buy my properties. I'm into, I believe in cash flow. I also believe in appreciation. I mean, I know I'm very focused. I don't get too distracted uh by what by what everybody else thinks is sexier you, you see what i'm saying absolutely That's and then advice. you can't learn the basics and then the, this is the important thing is to get a mentor somebody who is doing what it is that you are doing or that you want to do okay now not just doing it but are successfully doing it there's two different things okay there's a lot of these people doing stuff but there aren't a whole lot of people who are doing successfully. Okay. So you need to find those successful people in your market, wherever you are, who are doing what it is that you want to do. Okay. And they're, because they're out there. Okay. They may not be advertising and, you know, blaring. They're, they're there. Okay. And you have to go take the time to go find these people. And then you need to somehow incentivize them to want to work with you. Okay. And that's where you got to bring something to the table. Okay. And that's the challenge that you have, we have, we all have, is why should this person want to work with me? This newbie who doesn't know anything and so forth. Like you got to bring something. You got to figure something out as what value you can bring to the table. Okay. And if you can get that person to, to help you, the key is that they're going to, they've been through all this before. So they'll tell you through their experiences where the landmines are. Okay. If you do this, you're gonna, it's not going to work, okay? I'll tell you why, okay, and, and so forth. Because they've been through this path before. Uh, the quickest way to get somewhere is a straight line as opposed to going all over the place. And this successful person has probably got a good idea how to get to where you're going because they're doing it, okay? And they'll, they'll educate you on the things not to do, the mistakes. Now, if you want to do landlord in D.C., Section 8, I mean, I'm not saying I'm, I, I know it all. But I'm just saying that I know where the landmines are. <laughs> right. And I can help you avoid those landmines. Okay. And then you go out there and get on with it. Where's the wisdom? Wrapped it all up. Put a bow <laughs> on it. Call it a day. That's great. Thank you so much. I, I think the, some of the, some of the um, selfishly, a lot of what you talked about is going to help us. And I, I really appreciate it. But I was also going to give people a direction. And that was the whole key. It's bringing somebody on like you is going to give people a direction. Maybe you get eight people who want to go into section eight housing and hopefully people, um, which leads me to my next thing. Maybe they want to reach out to you. Maybe they want to learn. Maybe they want to be mentored or taught by you. How, if, if, if somebody's interested in hearing more about you, Joe, how, what's okay. the best way to get in touch or, or reach out? 
yeah, I mean, a couple of ways. I mean, uh, I'm always happy to, uh, to, to share knowledge. You know, I, I this great business and I'm always encouraging people to do it. The pie is so big, it doesn't matter if I teach everybody what I'm doing. It's not like you're going to buy the whole of the houses. Okay, it's, it's enough for everybody. Okay, mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm very uh, giving of, of, uh, of, of quality content. So anyway, you can go to my website, uh, Joe Asamoah, J-O-E, Asamoah.com. That's one way. Check me out. Um, you can go to, I have an Instagram and Facebook at Dr. Joe Asamoah, Dr. Joe, J-O-E, Asamoah. Uh, I do a Wealth Wednesday every Wednesday. I, uh, I did the one yesterday where I do a live stream, uh, seven o'clock Eastern time for now. Uh, it's free. So just come on. Uh, we talk about all different stuff. And uh, I'm also on Bigger Pockets. I have a, a live stream on them every other Friday. We just did one last week where we had a director from the American Association of uh, Apartment Owners. So we did cool. that uh, that one. I've had Barbara Cochran, the sh wow. uh, shop. She's been on my program. That's We've great. Had, We're gonna uh, tune in. Yeah, so we had quite a few people. So it's that every other Friday, 3 p.m. Eastern time, on Instagram and Facebook on the Bigger Pockets platform. And uh, you know, shoot me an email. Uh, you can shoot me an email at info i n f o at joasamoa and dot com and uh, I'll see what, if I can help you out. If you're in the DC area, let me know. And uh, I do have JV programs where I teach people what I do. I give people a chance to look over my shoulders as we do a deal. And um, it's the pie is big. It's a great business if you do it right. Uh, but you've got to be around people who are more seasoned and more experienced than you. You've got to. Otherwise, it's just, it's, life's too short, man. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. It, it is. That's why we're doing it. Because people, we know people that have done it and we want to be like them. So that's what it's all about. So. Well, we truly appreciate your time. Um, phenomenal episode. And, you know, I think people are going to really get a lot out of it and they'll be tuning into your, uh, to your social for sure. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much, Joe. Yeah. I'm more than happy to welcome, uh, what's it called, speak with people. Again, guys, thank you for inviting me. It's been a pleasure to share my content, and uh, I look forward to, uh, if there's anything I can do for everybody, just let me know.